Thank you. Yes, um, now I'd like to welcome our second guest, Professor Fenton, who is the Public Health Regional Director for London, and he plays a pivotal role in shaping public health of the United King Kingdom. Welcome, Kevin. Good morning, Kevin, how are you today? Thank you, I'm very well, how are you? I'm very well, thanks for asking. It's wonderful to have you here and thank you for participating in this amazing event and we look forward to, to listening to what you have to say today. Absolutely, so good morning everyone. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here with you this morning and what a privilege it's been to listen to Mayor Rees, uh, someone who, who I have personally admired for a, a long time and uh, given my role in London, I also work for the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. And so this whole issue of what cities can do and the role of cities fundamentally changing life opportunities for everyone, but especially the most disadvantaged, is something that I'm passionate about and something that in my public health practice, I've had the privilege of uh, helping to make that difference uh, throughout my career. So colleagues, today I've been asked to reflect on the theme of destinations, um, um, in part sharing my own journey, um, which is slightly different to uh, Mary's journey about why education is important to me, the values that education have imparted in my life, um, how I'm committed to education today, even as a medical doctor, a public health physician, and somebody who's working in government, why am I still so passionate about education? And then finally, I'll end by reflecting a little bit on some of the barriers which I know exist for so many for education today, which I also had to overcome. And what are some of the things we should be thinking about as we create much more holistic, integrated, supportive, diverse and inclusive educational system. So as you heard, I'm the um, regional director for London. I have been a public health doctor and a public health physician and an infectious disease specialist for more than 25 years. Um, I received my undergrad training in Jamaica uh, at the medical school in Jamaica and then I came back to the UK. I was born in the UK, raised in Jamaica and returned to the UK and did my postgraduate training and specialization before working within the NHS and working within the public health system as a, a physician. Uh, over the past two decades, I've had the privilege of working all over the world with my career. And it's been a real privilege to be able to both uh, lead here in the UK. I spent nearly a decade working in the US, uh, working both with the Bush and Obama administrations, leading national public health programs there. And then more recently, I've returned to the UK and I was one of the national directors of Public Health England. And more recently, I spent time working in local government and then I'm now working as the Public Health Director for the City of London. Um, and as you can imagine, this is a challenging time. We're in the middle of a pandemic and the pandemic really hit London very hard. Um, uh, earlier this year, we had some of the highest rates, some of the highest deaths from the disease. And thankfully, as we've emerged from the first wave of the pandemic, and as we're now experiencing the second resurgence, although it has not been as severe as the first, it is certainly something which I know all of us here in London, all of us across the country are concerned about. And the importance of children's education has been a key part of that as well. So that's just to introduce myself a bit, um, to set a bit of context for the conversation today. And I thought in the time that I had available, I'd just talk about three stories really, um, um, because they illustrate my relationship to education and why education is so fundamentally important to who I am and, and what I've been able to achieve. And why my love of learning, which was instilled uh, so many years ago, still forms part of who I am. So I wanted to share three stories with you and um, hopefully as we go through this morning, the stories will illustrate key aspects of the importance of education and the fact that it takes a village to raise a child, but once that child is raised, the potential which is unlocked can be phenomenal. So I think the first story then just to share is really why this love of education started and, and, and the role I think of that supportive environment at a very young age in helping to shape how we view education, how we view engagement in education. 
So, uh, you know, my grandparents were farmers, right? They were farmers in rural Jamaica. I so remember when I was three years old, waking up early in the morning to go with my grandfather, riding on a donkey to go up to the hills so we could begin to either pick bananas, dig yams out of the ground, uh, pee, peel and pick cocoa plants, and uh, we grew coffee and so forth. And that was part of my upbringing, uh, learning about the land, being in the land with my grandparents. My father and my mother were the first in their entire family to not only complete their primary and secondary school education, but to go to higher level education. My father did teaching. So for the teachers in the room, I, I give you great respect um, because I am a son of a teacher. Uh, and he uh, did his teacher training, went to university and he studied and taught chemistry. And he had a very long and distinguished career by the end of which he was the headmaster of the school. And very similar to Mary's this story about the power of a teacher in changing the lives. To this day, we still have students, and I was just growing up, students from all over the world who would write to my father, they hadn't seen him for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and say, you know, uh, Mr. Fenton, I so remember when you said X to me and how that changed my life. Mr. Fenton, thank you for being there when you, you know, upbraided me and told me to sit up straight and told me to, you know, be more uh, forceful in making my arguments because those lessons that I learned when I was 12, 13, 14 really helped to change my life. So my grandfathers were farmers and my grandmothers, interestingly, were both primary school teachers. But it sounds a lot more grand than it probably was. In those days in Jamaica, in rural Jamaica, being a primary school teacher meant you had a single room and all the young children who were there at the time were being educated on a similar syllabus and getting the reading and the writing and arithmetic, the basic education. But both of those women lived to their 90s and they were powerful influences in my life as well, both in terms of establishing some of the values around education, but also taking an avid interest in what their children and their children's children were doing when it came to education. So that pride that I know my parents felt or, or my grandparents felt about seeing us develop and seeing us being committed to education was an important part of that development. So that first story then is just to highlight that it does take a village to raise a child. And even although it may be difficult, and it is often difficult for many families, the, the power that you have by having that interest in your child's development, taking that interest in what they're doing in school, ensuring that you're engaged in that education and letting the child know that, that you're actually there behind them is important. A key part of my early experience then with education is being a child of a teacher. And for those of you who are children of teachers, you will know this exactly. So I was always the one who had to finish the homework and then show parents to make sure I could go out to play. Um, as I got older, I was the child that had to do the homework and then my father would set me homework and then I could go out to play. Um, uh, that there was always a bar that was set higher for us and there were four kids. so his expectation was not that we should be at the top of the class, but he expected us to always try to do our best because in doing our best, we know that we've given our all. And that's what he taught us very early and it has been a life lesson for me. And then the third, fourth thing that I, I sort of learned being a, a son of a teacher is that, you know, he was going to give us, there was an implicit contract in, in our house that we would have a roof over our head and food on the table and a supportive environment. But as a child, your part of the contract is to ensure that you do well in school, that you show up and that you get involved and that you're continuing to push yourself and you're continuing to learn. So I, as an adult, I've gone back to Jamaica many times and, you know, we sit with parents around the dining table and we have conversations about growing up and some of the things they did as parents and you know you have the chance as an adult to ask why did you do this or why was that so important and it strikes you that when you're young you think you know everything you think you have the world ahead of you and as a young person you have that bravado that you don't need the advice of older people and you certainly don't need the advice of your parents because you can do this you, you know I got this it's okay dad I got this but actually, as he was saying, and the conversations that we've had even today, 
It's all about guiding and uh, encouraging and opening a new way of thinking. It's about challenging your child and being challenged. It's about setting an expectation on value and worth, because as you heard from, from the mayor, oftentimes outside of the home, that value and worth can get hit. It can get hit very hard. And growing up as a child, there were things that I was struggling with that made it even more important that when I was in the home, that care and involvement and that support from parents was, was, was critical. So I start with that story to illustrate the power of family and the home as a center for not only education. I think so often uh, we want to um, devolve and give the responsibility of educating our children to the school. Yeah. So, you know, let the school feed the child, let the uh, school do the physical education. Um, you know, that's the school's responsibility. And I, I would argue that my own experience again, coming from a family and a long line of teachers really helped me to see the importance of the home as the start of education, the start of lifelong learning and the start of all the social changes that we want to see. So I think in summarizing that story, then I think there are three values that emerged as I, I left my parents' home in Jamaica. The first is that education is not only important, it is the most important thing that we can do with our lives. And that has been something that has stayed with me throughout my career and through everything I've done, that education is the most important thing that we can do with our lives. The second lesson is that education is a powerful weapon. And using that powerful weapon, we can change the world. And I know it sounds, you know, you may be asking, well, you know, what are some of the examples of this? Well, you know, in Look all around you, you know, whether it is the work that your teachers are doing or you're doing as teachers and the impact that you're having on the next generation, whether it's those of us who have chosen to do professions or chosen to do or passions in life, through that passion, through that training, through that learning and education, we are changing the world and we're creating a better place. And I firmly believe in education as a force for social change and now more than ever, this is going to be critical as we go through the pandemic and as we emerge from the pandemic. I think that's going to be a key defining feature of how we build resilience, how we recover, and how we create a different future post the coronavirus pandemic. So looking at education and investing in the ch our children's education and prioritizing education is going to be a key part for social change and development. And that's why the government, I think, is so committed to ensuring that education continues even during this difficult time. So the second story is just uh, telling you a little bit about my medical education and how that has changed my medical practice. So. I left Jamaica when I was in my early 20s, finished medical school, did a few years working in public health uh, in Jamaica. And the reason why I chose public health as my specialty was because a very, very powerful, um, influential, inspiring role models who were my lecturers and professors in university who were in public health. And they were uh, passionate about inequalities, passionate about social justice, passionate not only about treating an individual patient, but changing the health of communities, of nations, of the world, either by focusing on climate change, focusing on uh, education, on good work, focusing on curing diseases. And I thought, and I saw this whole world of medical practice opened up to me that I never knew existed. So by that time I finished medical school, I knew that I wanted to be a public health doctor. Now it wasn't the highest spade of specialties and perhaps um, growing up in Jamaica, everybody would want to be a cardiologist or a neurologist or a surgeon, you know, heart surgeon. And I have many colleagues who went along that pathway. But I thought that given my own values of social justice, um, seeing impact, making that difference, not on one, but for many, this would be an exciting um, uh, career for me. So I trained in public health here in uh, the UK. I went to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, after finishing that, I then went on to do my PhD 
in uh, uh, public health and epidemiology. And my, my work at that time was looking at why do we see variations in HIV and other infectious diseases across racial and ethnic groups? What are the factors which are driving those differences and what can we do about it? And as a result of that work and a number of publications and uh, policies that were developed as a result of that, that enabled me then to take on senior leadership roles, both within the public health agency and the departments of health. And then I had an opportunity to work in the United States for the American Public Health Agency, the CDC, where I led national programs there as well. So I think my work then in education in that space taught me a few things. The first is that education and health are intimately intertwined, intertwined. And in fact, as you heard from the mayor, education is a key determinant of health. So the more you invest in education of an individual, it's the more economic benefit you see, it's the more income that individual will gain, it's the more employment opportunities that an individual will have. It is the greater life expectancy that that person will have and the less risk that that person will have of adopting high risk behaviors such as smoking or drinking lots of alcohol. Uh, we know that your mental well-being and resilience is strongly associated with your educational attainment because education provides you with lots of tools that you can use to ensure that you're strengthening your mental health and well-being uh, as you grow and develop. So any understanding then of improving health for me was always going to be understanding that education has that significant influence on health and it influences everything, your life expectancy, your ability to have a long and healthy and productive life. And the data are absolutely clear, and we see this uh, consistently in our work here in the UK. And when I led programs, for example, for controlling HIV in the US, um, we used to say that one of the most important things you can do to help to reduce HIV infections, especially in young people, um, and in, in the US where we had very big differences between uh, racial groups, is encouraging young people to finish high school and to go into college and university. Because by giving them that focus, those values, that education and training, you delay the onset of a number of high risk behaviors, which can put young people at risk. So investing in education is key. And as I have practiced public health over the past uh, nearly three decades, I have seen the importance of, as a public health doctor, arguing for and advocating for investment in education. I have argued for and supported uh, interventions to help young people, especially young minority uh, students, to stay in school longer because the life benefits of that have a huge impact on so many health outcomes. I have done research looking at how we can develop health interventions in schools so that we remove ill health, mental ill health or physic poor physical health as a barrier for young people to achieve good education. And I've invested in programs with parents who are so influential in helping their children to both remain in school and to have and achieve the best that they can from their educational experience. So as a public health doctor, I'm an ally and I understand the importance of investing in education in order to address some of the adverse outcomes in life. And nowhere is this more clear than some of the work that we've been doing with the Mayor of London on reducing youth crime and violence, where the role of the, the home and the importance of education and educational entertainment, edu attainment is critical. So finally, just to uh, reflect then, I think I wanted to, uh, having told a little bit about my love of learning and how that has influenced uh, my career, I wanted to sort of finish by speaking about education, not as a moment in time, but as a lifelong commitment and why it is important that we continue to push ourselves to learn and to grow throughout our life course. Now, one of the things I 
often um, uh, teased on when I do sort of personality assessments or when I do uh, leadership assessments is that one of the most consistent characteristics which I have is the commitment to learning. And I often, uh, when I teach, because I teach university students, I teach postgrad students now, I say that one of the commitments I do every year, so I don't make New Year's, uh, 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 New Year's promises, but I do say every year I'd like to learn something technical. So some, something that improves my practice as a public health doctor, that enables me to operate at a very high level technically, so I keep investing in my training and my practice. Second, I commit to doing something and learning something that helps me to become a better leader. Because leadership is, again, not something that you learn in high school or in university and then you never learn again. Leadership practice continues to change and evolve. And it really is important that you continue to invest in your leadership and development training. And that helps you to take on bigger challenges, to be more resilient, to ensure that in this complex environment that we're working in, that you have the skills and tools uh, to manage it. But the third thing I commit to doing every year is to do something fun, to learn something fun. And learning is important because what you do as you learn is that you exercise different parts of your brain. It's a wonderful way of making new neural connections. It's a fantastic way and it's seen as an excellent way to prevent the onset of dementia because you're keeping those neurons and your mind connected in different ways. So every year I do something new. This year I'm learning uh, cooking, uh, Chinese cooking. I've always loved Chinese, so I've decided to do a little bit of learning about the techniques of uh, Chinese cooking from different subregions. A year ago, I did a conversation of French. I've always loved French, and I wanted to top up my French conversation uh, 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 the year before. The year before that, for those of you who are music lovers, I decided I wanted to go to DJ school to learn how to mix music and to use the skills uh, because of my love of music to be able to um, understand how you mix music, how you bring music and different sounds together to create this just a wonderful environment. I know it's a bit crazy, but that discipline of committing to learning something every year has been a core part of that value of learning. So how do we bring this all together then? So it's about education is not just going to school. It's a skill that you learn throughout your life course. And it's a skill if you practice it like every other skill, can help you not only to improve in your own personal life by developing new skills, new insights, new perspectives, but certainly whatever your chosen path professionally, whatever area of life you're going to be going into to make a living, it also helps you to continue to be the best you can be. Education is holistic. It's not just about the arithmetic. It's not just about uh, the writing. It's about how we see our place in the world, how we socialize with others, how we create our values, how we articulate our voices, how we do, de de derive change and how we stimulate change. And I think now more than ever, these are exactly the things that need to be done. I think it would be not be an exaggeration to say that education and learning are fundamental for us as human beings in the creation of the context, the connections that it creates and the ways in which it helps us to open our minds to others. And as we think about many of the challenges which exist and that we're having to grapple with, I would argue that education and providing the space for us to connect with each other, to learn together, to share our common experiences, but to learn from our differences and experiences are fundamentally important in helping us to move forward as a society and a society together. So colleagues, thank you so much again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I want to just share three stories and perspectives around this theme of destinations and the importance of education um, and to share perhaps a different experience. And this is what's so wonderful about events such as these, that as you listen to the presenters today, you'll see we have different paths different backgrounds, different influences. But what I'm hoping you'll see is that passion, that ability and the desire to make that difference and the fundamental ways in which we need to build the blocks both today and in the future. And th that building never stops. Thanks everyone.
Thank you, Kevin. That's uh, 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 fantastic. Really, really great. And some questions already being asked. And uh, um, we've got just 10 minutes for some questions before we take a break um, uh, so everyone can grab a coffee. Um, you've talked so much, Kevin, and you, you exude this. You are the inspiration that you talk about. You are the example. Um, and as you said, those role models have played such an important part in your life uh, growing up which gives you this love of learning and DJing and, and Chinese cooking and all of those things. Um, uh, perhaps they're tips for me. These are all things I know little about in life. But um, the, the, the issue is this, though, that there are many homes around the country that just do not see the value of education. So we have tens and tens of thousands of young people growing up and there'd be many educationists on this call who are responsible and who care for and who love these kids, but they know that they're not in the kind of environment you uh, explained to us, you enjoyed as a child. So the, the question is, you know, teachers can always work harder, can't they? And they do, do you know, go the extra mile and the extra mile and youth workers too, kind of throw themselves into the task, as no doubt you've seen over, uh, over the lockdown in your work in London. But beyond that, always pushing ourselves a bit harder, what, from your kind of helicopter view of things that are going on, what policy changes would you like to see? What policy changes could, could make the big transition, the big revolutionary change where as a society we came to value the kind of education you're talking about yeah so that's a great question and, and you, you know as i always reflect when i speak i recognize the privileges that i had growing up and i also recognize and i can see that those privileges are not universal and that's why my own commitment to breaking that cycle of disadvantage when it comes to education is so fundamental to the work that i do so you asked what can we do well you're absolutely right not every parent and not many many parents every parents will have an opportunity to give that focus on education especially if you're grappling with putting food on the table you're dealing with the challenges that life uh, is, 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 is bringing forth for you. If you're dealing with mental or physical health issues, these are things and these are the realities of many parents and many families across the country. So I think there are three things which I'm certainly using in my public health practice to think about how we have a whole community approach to educating children, even in the most disadvantaged communities. So number one, recognizing that the education of the child is not only the responsibility of the teacher and the educational system. And we have to move beyond thinking of it as that binary relationship, Steve, of that it's only the educational uh, sector, but that actually, as I've said today, that health has a role to play, the NHS has a role to play, faith institutions have a role to play, community organizations and the voluntary sector organizations have a role to play, businesses have a role to play. And there's something for us in the work that I did when I was in Southwark, uh, council as one of their executive directors there, really thinking about how do you harness those wider resources and assets to, in a sense, wrap around some of the most vulnerable kids so that that support is there and those opportunities are there. Number two, the role of mentors are incredibly important. There are often times when parents and families are not able to provide the sort of support and guidance to the kids but I, having benefited from mentors when I was a child, cannot underscore the import, you know, the importance of all of us being mentors and going back and giving back into the community. Because having that voice, that encouragement, if it's not coming from a parent, but if it's coming from a respected adult in your life, is going to be a critical part of helping to overcome some of the issues that you've mentioned. And then the third thing, which I think is important is that you know, a key part of the difficulties that we have with this issue, I would argue, is, is levels of poverty and deprivation and inequalities within our society. And I think we have to be honest about how do we address those in ways that allow for, whether you're a white working class or whether you're African Caribbean living in the center of London, to provide equity of opportunity 
for kids who start life with disadvantage. And yes, sometimes that may mean targeted programs. And yes, it may mean special programs to identify and fast track people from BME communities or from working class backgrounds to be teachers and to be leaders and to be in those environments that can really help to, to stimulate and inspire children. And those targeted programs are necessary for us to have an equitable approach to education. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have today. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a question, question statement here uh, from uh, actually from the, the chair of Oasis Community Learning from uh, uh, Keith, who chairs all the work that we do in our schools. And he says, isn't one of the issues uh, that we face that our view of education and what it values is far too narrow? Mm -hmm. uh, not all students will be academically successful, but may possess a whole range of other gifts and talents that we somehow aren't measuring at, at all. Society here does not value the practical, but we need people with practical skills. Yeah. So whilst you reflect on your response to that, there's another question in along the same lines from John Myers. And, and, and John simply says this, Professor Ken, uh, uh, Fenton, I, I so agree that education is the key weapon, but I wonder if in the twenties, uh, in the next uh, uh, decade, uh, it will switch away from what we know and instead become about how everyone can listen to and then nurture change in one another. Mm -hmm. What do you think of, what do you think of the, these two statements? Yes, a uh, great question. So I agree that uh, often our focus on education is limited. Um, I you know, know a lot about the German system, my partner is German. And uh, when you see how they both are breadth and depth of the education that children have and the opportunities for them to both identify their strengths, whether it's scientific or whether it's technical, whether it's you know, in, in a variety of fields, and to be able to be trained to be their best within any of those uh, desired pathways is just phenomenal because there's no value ascribed to whether you're doing science or whether you're doing management or whether you're doing carpentry or whatever, it is about being the best you can be. And I remember growing up in Jamaica that, and I remember it so clearly because I, I, my best friend in high school, we were separated after um, the, the seventh year, in the first year in high school, because I was an A student and he was a C student. And that changed your life, it literally changed our lives and our life of course, of course because of the, the quality of education and opportunities that we then got. So I agree about how do we both instill and value a wide range of pathways, but also how we instill a greater value in those pathways as well. So that actually it is okay to have a technical uh, 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 training. It is okay to actually further your education through apprenticeships and learnings. It is okay that everybody doesn't go to university and that's not a value judgment or statement. For the second question about education and where and how it should be moving, I think that's one of the things we're grappling with. I think education has to be dynamic, it has to be responsive, because it is of society and it has the influence to change society. And when I think about some of the unique things that this generation will have to deal compound, contend with, um, polarization through social media, and you're seeing that play out here in the UK, you're seeing it playing out in the US, understanding what is truth and what is fake news, being able to be a critical thinker in order to process information uh, in a way that allows you to make competent and consistent decisions, which can be beneficial to you and your life and the life of your family, and using your skills in ways that allow you to align what you're doing with your values so that you can actualize, be the best that you can be. And the ways in which we may well need a different kind of educational system, which provides a foundation, but then allows young people, I think, to move and to explore and to be able to cope with this world, I think it will be important. Now, I'm not an educationalist, I'm just a public health guy, but I can see the interconnectedness between our worlds. And I can see that we will need to equip this and future generations with very different skills to survive. One last question, Kevin. There are so many questions I'd like to ask you, but um, uh, one last question. You've worked in the States, public health, you are a public health guy, and uh, you worked alongside Obama and all of that, um, all of that stuff that's been going on. 
the way that the race issue is developed in the UK and in the States is very different. And I heard somebody saying just a couple of weeks ago that though things seem more violent in, in the States, the Black Lives Matter campaign is out there and in everyone's face, their, their commentary was it's because the crime took place in America. Mm -hmm. There was slavery on the plantation. So this is part of what America is and America has to face it. Whereas here in the UK, because the crime took place in our colonies, we orchestrated it, but it happened in the colonies. It didn't happen here. And therefore we haven't really faced up. Their argument was we, it, it, America might look in a worse situation with us with the polarization around Black Lives Matter, but actually they're facing it. We're not facing it because we never faced it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a, 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 you know, it's a really important uh, point and it's true. You know, one of the things that I am really interested in now in the Faculty of Public Health has recently announced an initiative on the role of structural racism within societies and how that negatively influences the life course, the achievements of so many people because of the systems, the power structures which exist uh, and how they are designed to keep uh, races, people in races in, in certain positions within society. And if we truly are going to be getting beyond and improving health and well-being. Yes, we have to tackle education and employment um, and you know, cultural issues, but we also need to name and address structural racism. And so the challenge that I think we have in the UK is because of our histories, and as you say, because so much of what we did as a nation happened in other countries, colonial countries at the time, there's a sense of the population here not coming to grips with that, not, not, and the history of it is being written, as it were, by the victors, so it's presented from a particular perspective. And the narrative which has developed about the UK's benevolence in ending slavery of championing human rights means that we're not allowed to sort of scratch beneath the surface and to actually challenge some of those narratives in order to get to a place of truth. So I think the discussion on Black Lives Matter today for the UK is one of self-reflection to say actually well how why do we have the House of Lords and why do we have certain structures within our society and how do they operate and who has access to that and why do they have access to that and how does it influence us today and, and how does it influence decisions today and those are some of the questions that I think we need to be asked in our society in order to get to a different place of truth and therefore outcomes. Kevin, thank you so much. Um, like I say, so much inspiration there, so much to think about, so many other questions that arise. Um, I'm going to hand back to Temi in a minute. We're really grateful for, to you, Kevin, for giving us this part of your morning, as we know how uh, busy uh, 